Coming up next on this week's edition of Being Well, we'll talk about exercise myths and roadblocks to success. My guest this week is Dr. Jeff Willardson from EIU's Department of Kinesiology and Sports Studies. He'll have a lot of great information to share with you, so don't go away. Jeff, thanks for coming on the show today and talking about a topic that, you know, you're also a professor, but also a personal trainer. So we're going to talk about a lot of the things that you hear in your field in regards to exercise myths and some of the things that keep us from getting to our fitness goals. Let's talk about what's the number one myth that you hear from people? A lot of people, when I talk to them initially about what their fitness goals are, they say they want to tone up. <laughs> Um, so usually what, what they're referring to is doing very light weight and a lot of repetitions. Um, but what they really want is muscle definition. Uh -huh. um, that involves a comprehensive approach of weight training and usually heavy weight training because we want to build muscle, but we also want to remove the overlying fat. And so that takes a lot of aerobic activity. Um, also, restricting your calories so you have that caloric deficit in there, so you're burning the calories so you can see the underlying muscle. Okay, well that leads us into the next question, and you see, I want to reduce this around my middle, or I want to get rid of this flab under my arm, and let's talk about spot reduction. Sure. Can you do that? Well, you know, <laughs> if you really want to get into the science, there is a limited number of scientific investigations, mostly from the 60s and 70s, <laughs> that actually showed uh, or tended to show that spot reduction might be possible under some circumstances. Uh -huh. uh, but we know for the most part that uh, spot reduction is not possible. Your body pulls uh, fat calories from all different locations. So for example, just because you're doing you know, 100 crunches a day doesn't necessarily mean that fat will be preferentially lost from that area. Mm -hmm. um, but over time with caloric restriction and aerobic activity, um, certainly fat would be lost from there as well as from other parts of the body. So when your body is burning fat, it has no idea that, oh, I think I'll take a little and burn this off and a little from over here. It does, it does the whole right. body. Right. It's more of an overall process from, from everywhere in the body. But again, you know, uh, because the area that you're working would have an elevated temperature more so than in uh, inactive areas of the body, to a limited extent, spot reduction might be possible under uh, certain circumstances. So when when you don one of those, remember those sauna suits from the yes. 80s, you know, that were basically like a garbage bag, you're just sweating and you will be smaller maybe around the waist, but it's just water. Correct? Sure, yes. Um, <laughs> the fat is not lost through the sweat. There's no, uh, sweat is composed of water and electrolytes, so um, there's no, you know, fat droplets that are coming through the skin. Um, but it'd be nice if it worked that way, but it doesn't. Yeah, it, it'd be nice, and you know, and the the compression effect may last for a few hours, but then, you know, your body would go back to its regular dimensions. So, <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about how how really scientifically, medically, does our body lose fat? I mean, how does it burn it, and what's the best way we can burn fat? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, during the workout, uh, the body will tend to rely a lot on glucose mm -hmm. initially, glucose or carbohydrates initially. Um, over time though, as your glucose becomes depleted, your body goes into more of a fat burning mode. Um, now, in terms of uh, fat loss overall, um, really the best approach would be interval training mm -hmm. uh, because you are alternating high intensity segments burning a lot of calories, uh, alternating with low intensity recovery intervals. Plus, interval training has a significant afterburn, or what we call the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Okay. That's the time when your body's recovering after the workout. And that's the time when you're really burning a lot of calories, oftentimes many more times than what you're actually burning during the workout. Really? How long does that afterburn last? I mean, it can I last anywhere. Uh, it, it really depends on 
how hard you're working out and, and you, you always have to stay within your individual limits, but it can last anywhere from 16 to 24 hours after the workout's oh, over with. That's kind of a nice thing. No. And you're gonna be demonstrating that a little later yes. in the show, so just, stay tuned. <laughs> yes, just as, just as your body temperature comes down, the hormonal levels come down, uh, the uh, certain substances are converted back to glucose in the body and mm -hmm. just a, basically reestablishing a resting state after the workout. Okay. A few years ago, it came out in the media and, and actually on exercise machines, these different heart rate zones and they were coming up with an aerobic zone, which we were used to, but then they came out with this fat burning zone, you know, lower heart rate for a longer period of time is a way to burn more fat. Can, that's kind of complicated. Can you kind of explain that? for us? Sure. Well, uh, with, with exercise, the, the biggest factor that affects fat burning is exercise intensity. Okay. Now, you have to consider this from two perspectives. At rest, you're actually burning a very high percentage of calories from fat. However, you're not burning very many calories overall. Mm -hmm. um, however, as you increase your exercise intensity, the percentage of calories you burn from fat goes down, but the total number goes up. Okay. So as you exercise harder, you're burning more fat calories, but the overall percentage is going down. So taking it from relative and absolute perspectives, it's really all about that interval training. Pushing yourself for a few minutes, backing off for a few minutes. And overall, that's going to give you the total package. And then after the workout, you get that great afterburn. Okay. Well, this brings me to my next question. And not enough time to exercise. And I know this is different for everybody depending on your fitness level. But if can you you know, see some benefits if you only have 15 minutes a day to exercise? Or do you need this whole you know, 90 minutes a day to, to take care of weight training and uh, cardio activities and all this sort of stuff. No, not at all. In fact, uh, in 1996, uh, the Surgeon General's report on physical activity put out a, a global recommendation for 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity a day. Now that can be intermittent, such as three bouts of 10 minutes, or it can be all at once. Um, also, you have to consider the intensity. You know, simply doing a few sets of jumps, just simple jumps, you know, as long as your body can handle it, as long as you don't have any joint issues, you know, can elevate your heart rate significantly. You know, jumping rope for 30 seconds um, intermittently throughout the day or doing a few sets of push-ups or body weight squats um, from a chair. Um, all those things just spread intermittently out through the day can raise your caloric expenditure, you, get, you can get benefits from doing those. Okay, so it's not, you don't have to necessarily have this big block time every day. You just no. gotta think a little more creatively yeah. about how you can uh, get that all in. Right. Um, I know you probably see with some of your personal training clients, people often get to a plateau. They probably get to plateaus on their weight loss and on their fitness training. What, what kind of causes that plateau for people? Uh, well, you know, it's, sometimes it's a lack of, of what we call variation or periodization. Uh -huh. So uh, sometimes we get stuck in doing the same routine over and over again. We may vary our repetition just a little bit, but still overall, if you look at the big picture, still doing the same thing uh, week after week, month after month, it turns into years, pretty soon you're not making progress. So mm -hmm. my suggestion would be try new things, try new exercises, do something your body's not used to doing, do something that maybe you're not comfortable doing. <laughs> Get outside your comfort zone. Uh, as many variables as you can vary over time will tend to get you out of that. And, and set goals for yourself. Write things down. Keep a training journal so you know exactly what you did the previous workout so you maybe have something to improve on the next workout. Well, and I think you have to think about way back when you started exercise or started a weight loss program, that change in your body made everything sort of happen right away. Well your body is pretty smart and it gets used to it. So I think when you can throw something new at it after a while, it will kind of wake, it wakes the muscles up, correct? That's right, you know, and it, it's exercise economics. Uh, when you first start an exercise program, you put in just a little bit of effort and you get a huge return. Right. Don't we wish our, our, like our, mon you know, we wish our, our investments worked right. like that. Right, right. <laughs> just a little bit of money and you get this great big return. Well, exercise works, like this, you, you, you start out, you put in just a little bit of effort and you get this big benefit. Well, over time, you put in more and more and more effort, more and more of your time, and, and you get just a little bit better. 
And that's why athletes spend hours and hours because they want that little bit of improvement. Well, if we're just training for health and fitness, we just need to continue trying to push ourselves just a little bit more. We don't necessarily have to reach the elite level, but our body responds well to variation over time. All right, so we've talked about cardiovascular work and you know, burning calories and burning fat. Let's transition into muscle. I'm sure maybe more men out there are like, oh, I want to shape. Can you shape muscles and you know, work on specific areas to get a certain desired shape? Is that possible? Well, again, there's a certain amount of research evidence out there that shows that different portions of a, of a single muscle can be emphasized with different exercises. So that's why we say vary the angle and vary your posture and vary your grip width and the type of grip, such mm -hmm. as an underhand grip or an overhand grip, et cetera. Um, overall, the, the shape of muscles is really genetically determined. It's very difficult to increase the actual physiological length of a muscle or the, the way a muscle looks in terms of how it's proportioned. Um, however, to a limited extent, yes, we can, and, and it makes a great difference in terms of strength gains to vary different uh, uh, ways the exercise is done mm -hmm. from, from grip to posture and things like that. So let me ask you real quick, is it, and I, I'm sure, explain the difference between lifting heavy weights, fewer sets, and lighter weights, and a lot of repetitions. They both do, they do different things, correct? Right, yes. Uh, the, the heavier weights is for maximal strength mm -hmm. and muscle hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is just a fancy way of saying muscle size. Okay. Uh, doing light weight with a lot of reps uh, builds what we call localized muscle endurance. Um, you have to look at this on a continuum because if you're lifting heavy weights, you also tend to build a little bit of endurance. Mm -hmm. And especially in the beginning stages, if you're lifting lighter weights, you're probably also going to get a little bit stronger and your muscles will grow just a little bit. And we have to also consider that having muscle is a, is a very good thing because muscle is very compact, mm -hmm. it's very dense, your clothes fit much better when you, when you replace a portion of muscle with, uh, or a portion of fat with a portion of muscle. And so um, overall, I, I, just as a general recommendation, I would suggest doing moderate weights, moderate repetitions, meaning in the range of about 8 to 15. So a resistance that allows right in that zone, 8 to 15 with one or two minutes rest between sets. Okay. And explain too real quick, I know a lot of women, because you, you have a lot of personal training clients who are women who I think sometimes worry about getting bulky if they lift heavy weights. Is yeah. that well, true or not? <laughs> most of the time it's not true. You okay. know, every, every characteristic um, in the population can vary, but most of the time uh, women have about 30 times less testosterone okay. uh, than men. Um, women do produce some testosterone, some produce more than others, but mm -hmm. overall about 30 times less, which really limits the ability to add significant muscle tissue. Okay. But again, if, if a woman is, is afraid of, of getting too bulky, um, you have to consider again that, that muscle is very dense and compact um, so that the body will be much more tight and streamlined um, versus you know, carrying around more body fat. So what we're doing is we're altering the composition of the body, um, creating more lean tissue versus fat tissue. Um, well, the body weight may not change. Okay. Well, that makes, that makes sense when people walk around and say, well, muscle weighs more than fat. I mean, a pound of muscle weighs the same amount as a pound of fat, but can you talk about that density? That's kind of the key, and then that leads into muscle burns more calories than fat. Yes. Density is a, is a measure of what we call specific weight. Um, the weight of a substance uh, divided by the volume or mm -hmm. how much space. So. We take a pound of muscle and a pound of fat. A pound of muscle takes up much less space than a pound of fat. Mm -hmm. And so a, a, a pound of, of muscle has a much higher density than a pound of fat, which means that it's much tighter. It's much more compact versus fat, which is more spread out. Okay. takes up more space. Okay. And so it is true that if you have more muscle mass, you can actually eat more calories because that takes more effort or more cal more yes. calories to keep that uh -huh. muscle going. Yeah, the thing about fat tissue is it's not metabolically active. Um, it just kind of sits there uh -huh. um, on your body doing nothing. Uh -huh. Whereas muscle, on the other hand, is constantly recycling itself. Um, especially if we exercise, it has to repair itself and go through this recovery process. 
whereas the fat doesn't do that. It's a very low metabolically active tissue. And so um, more muscle means, yes, you can eat a few more calories. Okay, that's good to know. Well, as long as we're talking about muscles, we often hear, this goes back several years, the myth of no pain, no gain. There, is there some truth to that, or do you have to feel a little pain to move forward? Well, you know, if your purpose, it depends on your goal. You, you kind of have, have to look at this from two perspectives, health and function versus performance. Right. Um, sometimes you get a crossover between the two because you have people that, you know, are a little older, but they still have that competitive drive to really push themselves. But, you know, looking at it from two perspectives, if you're an athlete and you want the highest level of performance, you want to reach your, just your absolute possible best, then you have to push yourself, and sometimes that's going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, however, if it's for health, you really don't have to put in that much effort. It's just a process of, you know, you could stay with the same program and not necessarily improve your fitness so much. It's more about burning calories. Mm -hmm because there is an association between the expenditure of calories and mortality. So you live longer if you're expending a certain number of calories on a weekly basis, okay. whereas um, you don't necessarily have to improve your fitness level to get the health benefits from exercise. But a little bit of muscle fatigue, a little bit of soreness the next day after a good workout is, a, is, a, is fine. Of course, yes. Um, you know, um, the principle of progression would apply here too, and it helps give you some validation psychologically that you're doing something good if you feel just a little bit of soreness the next day. So. Okay, but not so much that you can't get out sure. of bed. Sure, <laughs> you know you're going too far then. <laughs> That's right. Let's talk about one last thing. Um, let's talk about, you know, when is it time, you know, once you finish a workout, how much should you eat and drink? And I know it depends on what kind of workout you've done. Um, what sort of recommendations do you have? Should you be eating some sugar, some carbohydrates, some protein after you've, say you've done a typical interval circuit kind of workout? T timing is really the key yeah. and, and timing is an important factor. There's been studies done where uh, people were lifting weights mm -hmm. and they took a certain amount of protein in the morning and in the evening versus taking the protein uh, right before and right after the workout. Um, the muscle building effect was greater when they took the protein right before and right after. Uh -huh. So the timing effect is critical. Um, if you can give your body some building blocks like protein and carbohydrate just before and just after the workout, that's going to be assimilated much more readily. Okay, rather than waiting, you right. know, two hours. Yeah, don't wait. You're, <laughs> uh, right after a workout, uh, your body's going to be primed, um, your insulin levels are going to, to go up and allow that, that to be taken into the muscles for rebuilding and recovery. Okay, so good to know. Don't forget, you can watch more Being Well online anytime. Just visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash weiutv. You can watch full episodes plus demonstration segments from Season 1 and Season 2. Exercise really doesn't take a lot of time if you do it correctly. And so today we're going to go through a few exercise moves that'll help you make the most of your time with limited equipment and with also minimal space. And so today I have with me uh, Nancy Crone, and she's a hard worker and she's going to be demonstrating some of these exercises that you can do right in your own home. Let's start off with today with just a squat with a medicine ball. There are several different variations of squats you can do. Um, the basic cueing or technique factors are, are the same. Um, you want to vary the level of difficulty according to your fitness goals uh, as well as your orthopedic limitations. So if you have knee, hip, or low back problems, you really want to make sure you're very careful with this exercise. So Nancy, I'll have you take this ball. Go ahead and stand up here. Now notice, Nancy is standing, um, maybe slide your, slide your feet forward just a little bit. Okay, so Nancy's standing about a foot in front of the ball here. Notice we have the, the stability ball wedged up against a bench here for stability. And the ball is going to provide more or less a depth monitor for Nancy. And so Nancy has worked her way up to a, a little bit more difficult progression here with this exercise. So I'm going to ask Nancy to hold the ball right above her head 
You really want to make sure you're very tight in the abdominals and the hip region. You want to sit back, so push your hips back, and then stand up. We'll have Nancy slide back just a little bit there. Okay, so she, she's now about eight inches in front of the ball. Okay, and just sit right back there. Good, and stand back up. Good. Notice how Nancy's pushing through the heels. She's coming down, briefly unloading, and then pushing back up through her heels to the top. Okay, so again, for general fitness and muscular benefits, we want to keep our repetition range in the 10 to 15 zone, moving from one exercise to the next to maximize that caloric expenditure. The next exercise we're going to do is a prone hip abduction exercise. This exercise is important for pelvic stability, which is very important for preventing low back pain. So what I'll have Nancy do is flex the knee 90 degrees. Notice she's supported on the toe on the opposite leg. Push the, push the heel towards the ceiling just a little bit, leading with the knee, coming out and back in. Let's do five repetitions just like that. Two and three. Four, one more, and five. Very good. Now notice two things. First of all, we have a ball here which provides excellent, excellent support in this supine position, or prone position, and then we also have the ball wedged up against this bench for stability. So you want to make sure you do an equal number on both sides, so we'll have Nancy do five more on this side. Okay, now we're going to focus on another combination exercise. This is going to be a dumbbell chest press combined with an abdominal crunch. So again, making the most of our time with this exercise program. So I'm going to hand Nancy these weights. You want to make sure that, uh, that you're comfortable with the weights you're working with, something that's moderately heavy. Okay. Okay, so now this is Nancy's position where the low back is in contact with the ball. Her torso is on a bit of an incline here. Feet are nice and wide for stability. She's going to make a nice arc down to where the upper arms are parallel with the floor, coming back up and into the abdominal crunch. Good. Let's do this five times. Two. That's the way. A little bit more bend in the elbows. There you go. Okay, now we're going to do a rowing exercise. And so it's very important that you complement your pushing movements with some pulling type movements. This is a dumbbell row exercise. And so the first thing I'm going to have Nancy do is position her body correctly. One hand on the ball here. Notice how the back is flat. The knees are slightly bent. She's going to grab the weight with her left hand there, keeping the back flat, and rowing the weight up into the torso. Just like that. Repeat for five repetitions. Two, three, four, and five. Now we're going to be working on a, another calf exercise. And so this one is done in a seated position on a stability ball. And because you're sitting on this unbalanced, unstable surface, that's going to force the abdominal muscles to be more active. And so we're getting multiple muscles at one time. So notice Nancy's sitting here with excellent posture. She's got the weights positioned on their ends over just, just a little bit uh, proximal to the knee joints. And what she's going to be focusing on here is raising up on the toes. Just like this. Repeat. Two, three more. Three, good. Two more. Four, that's the way. And five, good. Okay, now we're going to work on some trunk rotation. And this is a very important movement, and oftentimes neglected movement, but certainly important. You have to make sure that you don't have any low back pain before doing this exercise. But it's so important to work trunk rotation because we do it so often in our daily activities. So I'm going to have Nancy position her feet with the toes angled out. 
a wide stance, and we're going to do one side at a time, so bringing the ball down to one knee, again, keeping the knees bent and loose, hips pushed back, and we're going to come across the body, looking off in the opposite direction diagonally. Here to here, just like that, good. Here to here, let's try that two more times. And Nancy's focusing on keeping her abdominals and hip muscles tight as she's doing this. And then you'd want to switch sides and do the opposite pattern. Okay, so coming to the other side and push up there just like that, good. Her knees are slightly bent, it's the way. Okay, the last exercise in this series is the opposite arm leg raise. Um, this is a very good exercise, a, a more advanced version would be lying over the top of a Swiss ball here. Now this Swiss ball, or sometimes called a stability ball, reduces uh, the amount of stability, and so you have your whole body balance challenge. And what that translates into is greater muscle involvement, greater muscle activation. So what I'll have Nancy do is, first of all, raise the right hand, thumb up, and also the left hip, you want to get really long through the torso so you create the greatest possible length in your leg and also in your arm here. Reaching with the arm, reaching with the foot, parallel with the floor, one straight line, and then let's do the other side. That's the way, just like that. You'll notice Nancy's muscles are working really hard to keep her balanced on the ball. Let's try one more with each side. Long through the torso, reach up nice and high there. That's the way, awesome. Okay, one more with the other side. Very, very good. And back down. Exercise does not require a lot of time. It also doesn't require a lot of equipment, and it doesn't require a lot of space. The key is to keep moving, make the most of your time, use your body weight, to challenge yourself, to keep progressing, to reach that next level of fitness. I encourage you to do some type or some form of these exercises on a daily basis. Again, trying for moderate repetitions, 10 to 15 repetitions per set, moving from one exercise to the next.